um, connection between King Pasanati and the Buddha. Now, um, the um, In the, the opinion of the author, the person that put the book together, you know, these predictions will be of value for those of you who are interested in studying future events. And we've tried to keep the original text as much as possible from the translation. The, um, the, you have to consider that it's truth by yourself and maybe you can pass this knowledge on to your own descendants to help them to understand that this truth is uh, an old truth is still applicable today. Furthermore, I want to ask you to use your own ability of reasoning, and this request is very good, in contemplating the truth behind these predictions and apply knowledge to gain some of them for your own daily use. You're going to hear things in these predictions that ring true, and they do align pretty much with Nostradamus for the time period that we're talking about. So we go to dream number one. We're going to cover these dreams, and I think we can go through these pretty much in about an hour or so. King Pasanati's first dream, this is dream number one, he saw four stout oxen that came running out uh, from all four directions. Furious with anger and grudges, they looked like they wanted to fight until the death. But when they got close to each other, they just retreated without crashing into each other at all. Now, the Buddha made the prediction. Uh, it was an inauspicious event and in, will come in the distant future. There will be natural disasters happening everywhere. Rain will not fall in time. There will be very large clouds that are coming from the four directions, and it seems that there will be very heavy rain. And once all four of the clouds have gotten together to one another, they will retreat without a drop of rain falling to the ground. And the results will be a long drought. Humans and animals will be famished and die in large quantities. Survivors will become immoral. And finally, the four superpowers countries in the world will declare war and they will verbally fight with each other and try to destabilize their opponents. But all of this will not bring any good results or changes. And this type of calamity will occur in the future and can be seen and heard not too long from now. You can go back in history and fish around for that one. There's several different times we've had the superpowers clouting at each other. Most of the time, uh, I think it has to do with the, uh, the one industry that makes the most money when people clout in each other. And it has to do with the military industrial complex and the production of industry. And that's even way back in the beginning. You can look at the Italians with Leonardo da Vinci's period. You can go back even farther than that. You can see all different types of things over the weapons they're making and things. Dream number two is King Passanati's second dream. He saw all kinds of trees, not big enough to be able to bear flowers or fruits, but they were full of fruits and flowers to the extent that the branches and the limbs nearly could not support them. The Buddha made this prediction that the trees in the distant future, daughters that are too young to have husbands, desire to be married and start a family in their very young age. And some have indulged prior to their marriage without shame. And once, they are pregnant, they will find a way to abort their fetuses before birth. And thus unwholesome actions, they commit great sins, which will have their results in the future. Some adolescents will be under the care of their parents. Some have parents that can't take care of them. Neglected, they become vagabonds, practicing petty crimes like theft, and later even robbery. 
and some become beggars and drifters with no parents, families, or a chance for an education, and no home or domicile. They sleep wherever they happen to be when it's getting dark. And some may, <clears throat> may stay on a bridge waiting to rob someone to support them, them, to support themselves. And those that are attractive, they become prostitutes. And some grow up to be hooligans extorting protection money from newcomers. And some of them just sleep on the roadside. Some will entice those kids that have problems with their parents or come from broken families to become their followers by offering help at first. But once the kids can't conform, perform their tasks, they will just leave them without food in misery. As some of the kids' limbs will be amputated or their fingers or toes will be cut off so that they can become handicapped and turn into beggars to make more money. And when it's time to beg, they will be taken by vehicles to various locations, but the boss will be well-dressed and sitting around monitoring the activities. And when it's time, the vehicle will pick them up. This type of calamity will occur in the distant future. And those that live in that epic, they will see many of such activities everywhere, day and night without shame. And it will not be too long before it can be hard, it can be heard and before it can be seen. Now, you know, in the West, in the United States, they talk about this is 1960s. <laughs> And this all started happening. And so everything that's described in here happens. And kids were left, um, you know, kids would run away from home, leave their parents. And then we came after that in the 70s, we came through periods of time where um, all kinds of stuff was going on, just all kinds of stuff. You remember Jim Jones, if you remember Jim Jones was someone who persuaded everyone to join a cult and then down in the Caribbean, they all committed suicide together. And he, he told them, you know, they were gonna to be together somewhere else. And then there was another group in California that told them when Haley's Comet came through, they told this group was over a hundred people. They did the same thing. They all committed suicide so that they would reappear in the rocket ship in the tail of Haley's Comet. And these people were lost and they believed all of this and uh, it was a very, it was a very terrible time. But everything in there that's described, you might have heard, you remember the movie about Calcutta, about um, slum, slum, what is it, slum boy millionaire? What, what was the name of it? Slum duck. The, slum duck millionaire. Okay. Do you remember the boy in the story that was a friend of his who's who lost a limb and was placed in a tunnel as a beggar at a good location to make more money for the pimp? that was handling him, the boss. And one of the other little girls became a prostitute. All these things are described. The next one is dream number three. King Pasanati's third term, he saw a herd of cows and bulls that were drinking milk from their offspring. The Buddha made this prediction about that. This is the bovine. Uh, in the distant future, parents will depend on the labor of their children. Food and other goods, including money, will be provided by their children. And in that era, the parents will have to especially please their children. And they will have to be biased if there are several children and their financial status is not equal. Parents must flatter and praise their children. They must talk politely to them in order to get them to share their money. If the parents do not talk nice to the children, they will not get any of the shares from them and they may get sent to old people's facilities or nursing homes. And the children might curse at them or chase them out of the house to live alone. And perhaps they will buy life insurance on, on their parents to get rich after their death and they might have a nicer funer funeral that way. Uh, this uh, type of calamity will occur in the distant future, it will not be long for us to hear and to see it happen. Well, this, this is another one. I mean, I was working with a family at home where there were 12 kids in the house 
And I said, how can there be 12 kids in the house? And she, her husband had died and she was getting remarried, but those children were all from her first marriage, but they had mostly failed going out on their own and many of them had moved back, but they wanted to basically what we call freeloaders, just come home and stay and live off of what the mother was trying to do with her life in that house. So um, I taught them how to do a sort of a peace reconciliation with the family. And they had to take the four noble truths and examine them, sit down together. And they all had a say in uh, what, the, what the challenge was, the suffering in the house and um, what the cause of it was within their personal opinion. Each person had a chance to write that down and then write down uh, what it lo would look like if there was a cessation of the, of the problem and then write down what they thought the solution was. And then her fiance and her, they had a meeting and they all came together and they settled this whole thing. And she and he, he and her, they, they went away for a weekend. And um, when they came back, the kids had cleaned up the whole yard they had repainted the house, fixed everything inside, repaired the plumbing, everything, because they all of a sudden realized what was happening. But this is a very sad thing with people who plan for their retirement and their kids show up on their doorstep and say, oh, we've lost our house, we're home. And there goes, they have no retirement. They have nothing except the kids are back in the house. And then it's, can we get all alone or not, you know, with different, different ages, it's difficult. But it happens all over the world. Talk to people in Europe, talk to people in Asia. It's the same story. King, dream number four, King Pasanadi's fourth dream. He saw a group of people harnessing calves to pull their wagons and beat them when they couldn't pull the wagons. And the Buddha made this prediction. In the distant future, people will save favor fresh graduates who lack experience, ability, uh, omniscience, and circumspection, and still do not understand social customs to govern a country, economy, and society. And they will allow them to govern the affairs of a country, which is a difficult task. Look at Canada, look at how young the prime minister was there. Okay, and um, here was the other one. Um, yeah, the, um, when I was in my business in human resources and personnel placement, all of a sudden um, we saw, I've had it for 14 years. So I had a whole 10 year cycle plus four years into another cycle. And one of the things that happens is they don't hire people uh, who have experience and so in the retail industry, things were collapsing in a lot of stores. And when we examined what was happening, they were taking people into retail, large retail stores. I mean, great big department stores. And they were giving them positions with upper mobility into management, but they had never done sales and they had no sense about retail at all. They only had a four year degree from college that for retail management. And when they put those people in charge, everything started to collapse. They were too young and too inexperienced. So, so this is like a, um, you know, a, a kind of business where it was really, really affected. Big department stores collapsed. And no one expected this in human resources. We expected to go out and find people, but everybody was trying to pay less money to the upper people and they accepted them. They allowed them to govern the affairs of the country because of their inexperience. They bring about mistakes that they can't keep up with changes and, um, and, and that occur too rapidly and they lack res responsibility and they create trade deficits that will ruin the country. Um, people that elected them become dissatisfied in the way that the uh, that they govern the country and they will score them without trying to help them to solve the problems and this is what happened in also in uh, hospitals hospitals this happened uh, and protests will occur periodically and they would score these people and they did it with teachers all those so they scored the teachers uh, in the teaching system in the United States about 10, 15 years back. 
And, um, you know, some of our teachers actually couldn't read, but they were the best teachers in the world. But because of it's complicated, <laughs> you know, there were all mis balances of things that you couldn't understand some of these people how did they get their teaching credentials but they were very good very good teachers other teachers deserved to be fired they couldn't read or anything and didn't do anything about it those who have warm and supporting families will be able to cope with this those having not having family uh, will have to flee the country and some will commit suicide to escape from their problems and some will have to separate from families and cause affliction to their wives and children and such incidents have occurred countless times all over the world sometimes they will kill each other because they do not want to be chased away and sometimes they work for the country but disobliged their uh, superiors or uh, they disobeyed their superiors or their financial supporters in the election time. And so they will end up getting terminated. We just saw a whole lot of that, didn't we, in the United States? And some, uh, we're going to see a lot more. So, and some, some that used to conduct a business together in the past and be, became powerful, but could not benefit their clansmen enough will get deposed from their positions and those that are equally powerful will use the country's interest in bargaining and cause dilapidation to the country. Some will bring down their superiors to steal their power and hope that the people will believe that their superiors are on their side to gain trust and power. But both groups will weaken or even destroy the country for their own benefits. And this type of calamity will occur in the distant future. It won't be long and you will hear and you will see it happen. So then dream number five is King Pasanadi's fifth dream. He saw a one-headed horse with two mouths, which can eat grass with both mouths but will not get full no matter how much it eats. The Buddha made the prediction that in the distant future, judges will exhort money from both sides of the parties as bribery for inquisition. And in some cases will get postponed to acquire more money and they will request all kinds of fees for their own satisfaction without mercy or ethics. And if they do not get what they want, uh, they will not take the complaint. They will shamelessly demand as much as they desire. For small cases, they will demand according to the prop proportion or in uh, the big cases, uh, they will demand for the maximum and only then they will pronounce the case or overturn the case. So they will annihilate law and justice. And this type of activity will occur all over the world in every society. And this type of calamity will occur in the distant future. It won't be long and you will hear and see it happen. King Pasanadi's sixth dream, he saw a group of rich people bringing extremely expensive gold trays for foxes to defecate on and urinate on. Well, the Buddha made a prediction about the gold tray. In the distant future, he said that there will be foolish people claiming to be knowledgeable and trustworthy. They are well known in society, mature, but unreliable, and they will propagate that they teach the Buddhist teachings. In reality, they teach out of selfishness, desire, and lust and try to control and distort the Buddhist teachings. They try to adapt to the Buddhist teachings and blend it with their own doctrine 
and declare that my teachings are part of their doctrine, which will make most people misunderstand and assume that my teachings can blend with their doctrine and believe that they are one and the same. But those doctrines can't comprehend the value of my teaching in any way because their minds are not pure. And this type of people will exist in the future after my death. And there will be a great variety of doctrines that will claim to be a religion. You probably heard me talk to you one time about when Bhante accepted a position for the World Buddhist Council. And when we went for the nomination tour in Japan for about a week and a half, on the way back in the plane, I was examining statistics and doing dem demographics and stuff for the United States and trying to figure out what he accepted. <laughs> what position did you actually accept here? There are 320 million people at that time in the United States. And there was a claim there had been a survey and about seven or eight million people that were Buddhist in the United States, only seven or eight million. So what exactly was he getting into? And as I started to do research, I actually came up with 26 different groups that were Buddhist, 20 different kinds of Buddhism that was being taught, 26 or so. And over the years, it's grown to about 36 or 38. I don't even bother checking anymore because uh, we don't have a Pope. We don't have anybody who's gonna say we have to keep it in line. We don't, it isn't that kind of a thing. People can invent anything they want. And it's fascinating what goes on in the United States. When you come out of the United States, you don't see it quite as obviously. There is stuff going on and there are small pockets of it. But when the Buddha passed away, it turned into 18 sects. And one of those sects was Suttavadan. And we go back and say, we are Suttavadan. Bhante Bhimala Ramsey woke up Suttavadan, announced it worldwide to all the biggest monks in the world in 2008, okay? And so when he announced that, it was like, oh, oh you see. But, <laughs> but the point was in our country, <laughs> At that point, there was about 36 different types of Buddhism. And they're not friends. That's the interesting part. Uh, they're friends in front of the camera to get good publicity at a conference. But when you listen to them, just quietly listen to them discussing things, sometimes it sounds like the conflict you would run into with politicians. It's really fascinating. <laughs> So people from, this is more he said here, people from families out of lower social status will raise their status with education and gain important positions. People from higher social status will have to give their daughters to people from lower status because it's the error for lower people to gain power. And this happens because those families from higher status live in negligence. Not too far in the future, all will hear and see. There will be more turmoil in religions. Monks will deteriorate in discipline, not obeying their disciplinary rules. They do not practice like monks, but more like laymen and are only interested in rank and status. Their followers will try to bring them rank and titles. There will be great disturbance in religious circles and people will lose their faith and start to look for other refuges and they will turn to mediums and magic and fortune tellers because they can give them better advice than psychiatrists. There will be more of these things that happen in the future, and we will be able to witness this. I've been in, uh, all I can say, I'm going to say one thing here. I've been in India for four years. I've been around, and I still can't find monks who have Padimoko once a month. I can't find it anywhere. That's not true. Wait. In Tripura, Tripura has real Buddhism that migrated there from Kapilavatu where the Buddha grew up centuries ago, okay? And it still is happening exactly as it was being taught and followed 
and the celebratory holidays, particular things going on, the services, everything, and the potty mocha is done. And through all the villages and everything, the markers are in the ground and every month it happens. But in the rest of India, I can't find monks and I still move around and a lot of people come to visit me and um, I always ask, does this happen? And it doesn't happen. So by not doing that, that was always the leverage point for the purity of the Sangha. So you have to think about what, what is happening here, you know, with everything. Number seven, dream number seven. King Pasanadi's seventh dream, he saw a man weaving books into ropes on a bench. There were foxes waiting to bite and eat the rope when it was completed. Once the rope was completed, the fox ate all of it up. Okay, the Buddha made the prediction that in the distant future, people with immoral minds will obtain titles by working in high office and relying on the power of the king or the president or whomever, prime minister. They administrate the affairs of the country on behalf of the leader with foolishness, lack of intelligence, impolite speech, revealing in turn secrets of the palace to the common people. People from different doctrines with bad intentions toward the king will hear this and lose respect for the king and for the whole dynasty. And this type of calamity will occur in the future it will not be long and we will hear and see this. And those people with bad intentions toward the royalty um, will become destructive like Wasakala Brahman. And there are some other, um, there, there's several places that you can look around and see this when you sit down and think about it. If you look at history, what, what happened, you'll find lots of places where this happened. In then dream number eight, King Pasanati's eight dreams, the eights, he saw large earthen jars and small earthen jars in the same location. It was eight of each one. People will stand in a queue to fill their large earthen jars with water until they overflow, but no one cares to fill the smaller earthen jars, only the larger ones. And the Buddha made this prediction about the earthen jar. In the distant future, people will make donations selectively. Senior monks with higher rank will get attention. People will give too much offerings with expensive goods and food. Whereas novices sitting beside the senior monks will not be presented with any offerings at all. The people will have to work much harder to pay their tax to the country without thinking of saving some for themselves. And they will seek accommodations which satisfy their desires for luxury and comfort without end. And this type of calamity will occur in the future. It won't be long for all of you to see and hear this. And that's happened also. Um, this didn't point to it so much, but what happens is you, you heard, uh, well, if the other night when I read the other part of the, uh, the Buddhist predictions that Bhante pointed to was how does the, um, how is it that the the Buddhism comes to deteriorate and collapse specifically. And it talks about that. It talked exactly about that. And um, in some countries, the senior monks have priority. They like the way they're living. They don't want it to change. Um, families can leave temples and give up after hundreds of years and just walk away, 60, 70, 80 people in a family. And no one's concerned as long as everything is the way it should be for the senior. 
the senior monks and everything goes on. Not all of the countries are set up that way, but you can find this happening right now. That's what they're talking about. The reason why we're doing things, um, the recip I, what keeps coming up for me is reciprocity, the reciprocal agreement between the Buddha and the people where the Buddha was giving the people something very usable to make the Dhamma be alive and useful. And um, when that isn't done anymore, then what happens? When that's not being done, we find ourselves in a position sometimes where the people can say Pali back to the monk, but they have no idea what they're even saying and they don't even know what's being taught. That's the most recent shock for me in working on the Sunday school material and finding out that, that um, this, is what's this is what has been going on. It's quite serious. Okay, in number nine, dream number nine, King Pasanadi's ninth dream, he saw a pond with clear water, but the water in the middle of the pond was muddy and dirty. All the animals went to the center of the pond to drink, but they didn't care about the clean and cool water at the pond's bank. They just smelt it and they passed by it. The Buddha made a prediction about that, about the large pond. In the distant future, people will be endlessly greedy. They can't get enough possessions. Honest work will not be desirable because the small salary that they receive for it is not satisfied to their greedy minds. They apply for jobs in politics and once voted in, they handle the state's affairs and finances with corruptions. They try to get as much as possible out of their job as long as they have it. They work with the motto, may the best man win. This type of calamity will occur all over the world in every country, in every territory. It will multiply enormously and cause turmoil on every con continent. And some will be more corrupt than others and then they will eventually expose themselves, the secrets and can't get along anymore. And each party will have their own clique Occasionally, there will be revolutions and coup d'etats because of fights among the demons that stand around in suits. Capitals will not be suitable living places because of an increase in the, of dangers. The public will migrate to rural areas and this type of calamity will occur in the future. It won't be long. All of this, I've seen it. I've seen it. It's all there. Everything is there. Um, sticks in my mind, 25 years ago, about 25 years ago, I was in Central Virginia before I was working with Bonte uh, and becoming Buddhist. And in Central Virginia, I was a Chamber of Commerce president for a little while because someone died and they put me in that position. <laughs> And it was a good time for me to do something where I didn't have to deal with people. I could stay in an office and reconstruct an office for them. So I was doing that. There was a young man in Central Virginia community for where I was, I won't say where it is. And when he was voted into a council position in the community in the county, he was 21 years old. I was in the car going to Richmond and he was in the car with us, I said, so, so let me ask you a question. You've just been voted in. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do for the people now? And he looked at me in the mirror. I was driving. And he said, clear as day, whatever I want to do. I've been put in office now. I can do whatever I want to do. I'll never forget this. We thought he was a good pick for this too. And the moment he said that, my heart just went into my stomach. He's only 21 and he's been elected into an office in a county in Virginia. And he believes he can do anything he darn well pleases to do just because he's been put into position. It's very sad. That's what's happened in America. Very, very sad, some very sad things. Anyway, okay. 
So then, um, let's see, they were with the modern man, the best man win. The corruption thing, we suffer from corruption. We, we just have to look around Asia. We don't have to look far. But the Western countries are really rapidly catching up with what they used to say about Asia. I sort of laugh about it. 30 years ago, it was all in Asia, the problem set. And now Europe and in America, we don't have anything to say about anything. Corruption, extortion, unbelievable stuff happening today. Just amazing. So the next one is dream number 10, King Pasanati's 10th dream. He saw rice in a pot, which was in different states of the cooking process, you know, hard and soft and in the middle, cooked in one section and a half, cooked in another section, and a totally raw was in another section, all in one pot. And the Buddha made this prediction for about the uncooked. In the distant future, most people in the world will have differences in thoughts. One group believes that I am their refuge and truly respect me, but they believe that their teachings are correct. And when practiced to completion, it will lead them to completely overcome suffering. They believe in Nibbana, heaven and hell, and that there is such a thing as good karma and bad karma, but they do not change. And when they die, well, still they have passions and desires, they will be reborn. Another group is not sure if Nibbana still exists in this time, because it is a long time ago that the Buddha was alive on this earth. And they wonder if the Buddhist teachings is still the original. They wonder if monks that practice good self-conduct will achieve Nibbana. They are full of doubts and uncertainty and because of this they fail to do any good deeds or practice their ethics principles. They wander without refuge, they lack in morality, and finally find no refuge in their old age because they did not do any good deeds to prepare for the future. It's what we talk about, uh, the deception of the, the Sangha, uh, the idea that if you get in robes, you're gonna be fine and you don't have to behave and follow certain rules that everybody follows in lay life. There's, there's an imbalance with understanding what the whole teaching was. And you're familiar if you've been practicing TWIM even for a week you should have tasted that it is progressive and that you can feel that it is moving towards what they call noble path and you can actually experience path and it goes to something. So you, you, you probably have experienced this where you don't experience this in a lot of other types of practices. You can go for years and years and years and have people tell you, well, it just isn't possible because if you've ever heard this, it isn't possible because this is this time and that was that time that's not real, you know? And um, my brain is different than the brain of people that lived in the time of the Buddha. That's not real. They know that too. Another group will totally reject the concept of Nibbana altogether and they do not believe in life after death and therefore they are bound to mistreat their parents, society, steal the Buddha images, sell them, steal from the temples. And when Buddhism comes to its declining state, people will misinterpret the Buddhist teachings and prefer immorality more and more. And it will not be long for all of us to hear and to see this. And that's just a lesson of looking around. If you travel and start looking around what's happening inside temples and places, you have to just see the conditions that sometimes, uh, sometimes you can't quite understand it. There's a very large temple, it looks okay and everything, and it seems to be in a good popula population area, and there's a lot of Buddhists around, and yet the monks themselves are living in abject poverty inside that building. It's, it's hard to understand. And um, the people don't help the monks 
to be able to have beds and desks and chairs in their in their rooms and they don't have clean mattresses or pads to sleep on you'll find them sleeping on tables you'll find them sleeping on a cook's table in the kitchen you'll find them sleeping on the banquet tables downstairs you know, upstairs if there's not another room one monk might sleep on a porch with a bunch of pigeons that are uncontrollable about the way they live their life <laughs> so it's pretty messy you know and you're trying to figure out why is this happening if this temple is sitting right in the middle of this big population and this is a buddhist area why is it partially it, it is because no one took the time to teach the people the how to protect the monks but then when we turn around we have to not just point that direction we have to say what are the monks teaching the people again and if the monks aren't teaching the people something that they can use and feel how it makes a difference in their daily life, then the question is how long will it take before there's not um, there's almost no, no support at all for them to receive support because nobody's really coming unless it's a new car or a new house or a new baby or a marriage or a birth or a death type thing. And if that's all that the temples are for, and you're in an area where the lay people are not yet at a level of really good teaching, like in some countries, the lay people are at a very high level of teaching. And the survival of Buddhism in Malaysia, the people, there are a lot of highly educated lay people who are teaching very well. And there's some monks, there's some, and there's some beautiful temples there. But this is what I'm talking about. If you see the downtrodden situation, you have to wonder what's going on on either side. You can't point a finger at either group when nobody's sure what the Buddha was teaching. Dream number 11, King Pasanati's 11th dream, he saw a group of people exchanging cores of red sandal wood, which is expensive to trade with just a pot of sour milk, which is absolutely incomparable in price. The red sandalwood is a very, very expensive thing normally. The Buddha made this prediction, the core of the heartwood of the red sandalwood. In the distant future, a group of people will trade my teachings for money and they will publish and sell them uh, to make a living, the teachings, and they will try to make all kinds of business with my teachings to earn money, which is incomparable to the value of the teachings. And it's, it won't be long then that philosophers will interpret the teachings to be the same as other religions teachings. And they will say that I teach everybody to be good, but my teachings teach people how to achieve Nibbana, and which is reached by standing above good and bad. And philosophers will not practice my teachings, but they will try to interpret my teachings and appear to be enlightened ones. And there will be lots of these philosophers in the future, and these calamities will occur towards the end of the Buddhist era. And it will not be long and all will certainly hear and witness this. We can see this happening also. Um, I guess one of the things I saw that was, see, I'm very traditional. <laughs> I, I'm sort of been trained by a monk that is very, takes the whole thing very seriously, you know, but he's, He's really easygoing and you can talk to him about anything and you can ask questions all you want and everything. And he's always going to attend to giving you questions and training you. When we were in Texas, in the United States, I met a monk that was a Mahatera monk and he was a professor at a university. And um, he had just written a book. I don't remember the book, the name of it, but I do remember what was in it. I'll never forget it. Buddha is a family name. That's what he was teaching. Buddha is a family name. Now we know that Siddhartha Gotama, Gotama was the family name. 
where he got this, we don't know, but this is a Mahat, this is now a Mahatara monk that is saying this and who is educated and wrote a book and is telling the world and selling it in bookstores that Buddha is not a title or a level of education and learning and understanding. It's a family name. And so that then he, in the chapter about that says, it'll be handed down through his line. In other words, from son to son to son, like any other king, okay? And there were some other things in there that were quite upsetting, you know, that were totally off base, but nobody caught this. And so we're in a strange time now. And I'll show you where we are on the timeline at the end of this, okay? Give a couple of minutes, okay? So when we get to 12, we get to the next one. The 12th dream, he saw a dried up hollow bottle gourd sinking in the water, which would normally float on the water. And this truly baffled him. And the Buddha made a prediction that the dried up hollow bottle gourd in the distant future, good knowledge and wise individuals, both monks and laymen who deserve praise and admiration in society will be hindered by groups of bullies repeatedly. This is happening right now. Good laymen will not get a chance to work in the country's administrations. And those that are knowledgeable, capable, and honest will not be elected into the higher government positions. And if they will be elected, then there will be groups of dishonest people working for their own benefits, trying to harass them. And these dishonest people will regard the good people as evils. They will try to cover their own misconducts. Good people will not get a chance in their society and good monks will get the similar treatment. Good and well-disciplined monks, highly educated, will strive for the achievement of Nibbana or work to help the society to be considered as undesirable to them and get no respect from them. And they may share their abundant necessities, but without clear conscience, they may just offer very small amounts, but just enough of salary to get by. Those monks will have a difficult life and people will not want to go into monkhood for this reason. And eventually good monks will fade away and disappear from society. And this type of calamity will occur in the future and it will not be long before all will see this and hear it. And we see this in several different traditions happening. Number Dream number 13. He saw a solid block of stone as a, big as a ship floating on the surface of the water like an empty piece of bark. Normally such a stone would sink, but the block of stone just floated on the surface of the water. The Buddha made the prediction that this big solid stone in the distant future, bad people will be praised and be admired in society. They will have rank and power and will be popular and dignified. They'll have many subordinates and followers. And if they were laymen, they will be well-liked and respected everywhere they go. The crowd will greet them and please them. They're like a big mirror that reflects the image of that country. Prosperity or decline of the community of such a country will be seen in this big mirror, in the Congress, in this big mirror. It reflects the character of the elected members and the elected congressional members. They will have similar character to those that voted for them. And because they will pick the type of people who are similar to them and the trait will be the same for clerics and for ascetics. Whether the religion will prosper or decline will depend on all the four congregations. Without the help of monks alone, will not be eminent among the community. Monks can become famous because their followers advertise their goodness and sacredness and the miracles and talks they have performed. But their followers advertise their knowledge and abilities whether the monks like that or not, disciples of some monks will determine the character of their own teachers and turn them into saints 
or so-called established saints. And we've seen that as well. Disciples will make the public know strictly their teachers follow the principles beyond the actual truth. And this is the floating solid stone that is so eminent. It's a business hiding beneath the yellow robes of the monks. And some will arrange tours to visit temples just to get cheap vacation and overcharge others in the group. And some of them will take part of the donations. Religion cannot depend on these people because they misuse it to make a living. And finally, people will lose faith because they can see the unworthiness of the monks in that era and people with wisdom, stability of mind and ability to reason will seek for the true monks. And in the time of the decline of Buddhism, this type of calamity will certainly occur and it will not be long for all to hear and see for themselves, especially during the time of recession or war that this can happen everywhere, it has happened. Um, Bhante tells a story once about someone asked, well, is there a, really a Maha Sangha? And a Maha Sangha essentially are the monks joined together of all the different traditions. And the answer is no, there's not really a Maha Sangha because if you don't have any place to live or stay for the night and you knock at the gate uh, of one a different tradition, sometimes I'll come to the gate and say, why are you here? You're not from this tradition, why are you here? And you have to put your foot in the door in the gate to keep it from closing <laughs> and try to say, I need to see the abbot because I need a place to sleep. I've been through a couple of ventures like that. It's true, it's real, <laughs> you see. So the cooperation we think is there and, and we like as human beings, Buddhism has tendency to be uh, something that we want to say, well, that one is perfect and we'll leave our faith or something to go there because that one is peace loving and that one has never declared war for the sake of Buddhism and da, 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 there's all these things. Is it really true? You see, you have to look a little deeper, but my version of people is you don't judge anyone at all. My father was very strict about this. A man, a woman comes to you and they want to do something for you. you. You let them do it and then you see how they work and you see if they're reliable, if they tell the truth. Every person is based upon the walk that they take. It doesn't matter who they are, pink, green, purple, black, brown, white, blue, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what religion they come from, has nothing to do with it. Are they honest? Do they keep their word? They follow through with their agreements with you and things like that. The next one is 14. King Pasanati's 14th dream. He saw a small toad chasing an enormous cobra for a meal. Once caught, the toad immediately devoured the snake. I like this one. <laughs> Buddha made the prediction that a small toad chasing enormous black cobra and once caught, she immediately devoured the cobra as if it were a small insect. In the distant future, famous monks will great ability to give rhetoric and speeches will gain influence and power. They start to play an important role in society, are respected and trusted by people and gain admiration. And that makes them become conceited without conscience they do not know how to be humble anymore. We see in Sri Lanka, some monks decided to run for politics and they did, they, 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 um, they, they did run for politics. And it's sad to see that start happening. It's sad. The excuse is, well, if I run for politics, I can protect the monks. The deception is if you get into politics and have a secretary in an office and are into household things, just like going back into a house and having a family and trying to be a monk. You've just taken away all of the things that you renounced and gave up. So my point to the person was, if you're going to do it, it's fine. If you believe you should have been a politician, take your robes off and go be a politician. Not a problem. But keep your robes on and go into politician and play government games. Not a good idea. <laughs> Not a good idea. 
you ever see the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, you look that up and see it's an old thing with Jimmy Stewart. He was a pure in person, good person. And then he got elected and went to Washington. Take a look at that, it's still happening. The lack of wisdom and therefore the lack of ability to control their five senses in the mind, they get attached to beautiful sights, sounds and fragrances and flavors and tangible sensations and pleasant thoughts. And this will be followed by passion for love and sex. And they become possessed by sexual desire and therefore small toads, I don't like this part, the small toads are the women <laughs> who will see the opportunity to seductively lure and with charming words that fascinate the monks who are the cobras. And then the toad devours the cobra. And in the distant future, all will see and hear this for themselves. Number 15. Dream number 15. King Pasanati saw a crow surrounded by golden swans. Wherever the crow went, these golden swans surrounded it as follows. And the Buddha made the prediction that the golden swans served a crow. In the distant future, newly ordained monks and novices whose morals are not quite pure will surround, admire, and pay respect to immoral monks as teachers. The crow is clever and devious in giving gifts in return for the respect of all little swans, small swans and big swans. And the swans will show how important the crow is by sending gifts every month. And every year they'll gain more status and titles and they will not work by teaching the Dhamma, but instead they will flatter the house master for status and return. And when the era of decline of Buddhism is coming, there will be more and more immoral monks. Monks and novices who lack the education and guidance in monkhood will not understand the discipline and their duties. They will not conduct their daily prayer, but just watch TV. And in the rural areas, they will enter monkhood for the sake of tradition, or they will do it for money. Some will do it on their parents' request and while being ordained, they will bring entertainment to the temple, which violates the rules and regulations of the priesthood. And that brings unwholesome karma for their parents and relatives. And they do not perform monk's duties and they lack discipline. They neither listen or pay attention during Dhamma teachings and they talk without respect and are even proud of their immoral behavior without shame and are afraid of the results of their unwholesome deeds and this will happen in the distant future and all of them for all to hear and all to see. That's pretty self-explanatory. Number 16 is he saw a herd of goats. They were hunting tigers and enjoying eating the tiger's meat. Tigers were afraid of being hunted by goats and disappeared. In the distant future, people will not be satisfied with a monarchy and they will turn against the monarchy and vote for democracy. In order to decrease the role and the power of the king, they will put him under the same administration and the same laws as the people. And when the king rejects the proposal, they will start a coup d'etat to seize power in accordance with their desires. And if any king resists, they will eradicate the monarchy, the regime of that country. In some countries, the king consents to the people's demands, surrounds his power, and then he will be highly respected, trusted, praised as being moral supporter and a godlike individual. And he will become the center of the people's morals once the king consents to the wishes of the people, the voted for democratic government will soon be misguided and begin to believe that they rightfully deserve their status. They will misuse their power to benefit themselves, their siblings and their heirs. And eventually there will be other equally powerful groups that will try to take over and it will be endlessly going on. And this type of event will happen in the distant future 
and we will hear about it and see about it. There were two mothers that were in Sri Lanka and they had their children and they were, it's like a Girl Scout type thing in the Girl Scouts and they decided it would be really great since they lived in the vicinity of the parliament building to take their kids to see the parliament. So the one mother said, I'll go and I'll have a look. And the day she went to the parliament and she went and sat upstairs just to see what it was like to watch the parliament in action. They came in and they said some kind of opening prayer and then they got in a fight. There were different groups and over there, there are several, it's the same problem in um, Nepal. In Nepal is where the king and his family was murdered and the one son, I guess, came home and took power, coup d'etat type thing. It was a number of years ago. But this, what happened to the mother, what she saw was so outrageous. She went back to the other mother and said, we cannot take them to the parliament. It's not a place that any child should go and see before they grow up to be an adult. Let them be children. She didn't want to let the children go and see the government of the country at all. It was in a complete shambles, fighting so many different groups, so many different, uh, you know, it was amazing and <laughs> she told us the story and I said well it's a pretty good thing you went over there it would have been a hassle if you had 10 girls and you went in there and sat down and all that went on and then I looked at the Russian parliament once they were fist fighting and another another country they had fist fights literally I was so shocked I was spellbound I was in a hotel and turned a television on for a few minutes. I like to watch the advertisements. That's how I measure the culture by the advertisements. <laughs> and I was watching and they had this news program on a picture of these, this uh, one Congress where the, the groups in the Congress were just literally beating each other up, having fist fights and no one was stopping them. And I wondered how we were still here. And I wondered why, you know, when are they coming from outer space to get us? And maybe they just are too afraid to land. <laughs> maybe they're never coming, you know, the little people in space or the big people in space. I don't know who's there. <laughs> so this one is the last one. He saw uh, the goats and the tigers. And um, once the king can sense the people to the wishes of the people, the voted democratic government will soon be misguided and begin to believe they rightfully deserve the status. They misuse the power and the benefit for themselves. So these forecasts, you can, you can find King Pasanadi's dreams. All you have to do is look at the news, think of what you know, just from the big events you were told about in the news, and you're gonna find all these different things happening. It's not, it's not hard. Now, when you go through the back part of this, you have um, the uh, a framework. There's one good thing in here that's worth it to you. And that is um, the stability section. The next section comes in the appendix, okay? And what it is, is just telling you every, the first 500 years, the second 500 years after the Buddha's gone, third 500 years, fourth and fifth, and then in the fifth era, and then it goes a little further and it goes to the world's revolution part. The, prediction, the second part of the book is about the world's revolution for survival. And it goes and goes by the Buddhist years. And you look at that, and if you sit in a library or you can do it on your computer and pop up some of the news that's going on for those particular years, you're gonna find an alignment that's pretty shocking. So this is, this is your Buddhist Nostradamus experience. This is what he's done in his dreams survived. And then the, the one, another section is the uh, horoscope for Thailand specifically. And um, it goes, breaks it down to the, the rains that occurred in Thailand and what happened to try and show you how it aligns with their life, how these different dreams lined up but they align worldwide. We all have some things basically in common and it's not, it's not different country to country. That's our commonality. I, I cannot understand why it takes people so long to sit down and look at commonalities instead of, you know, 
what you're always going to do if I go meet Bharath Ramesh and I say to him, you know, let's work this out. And then my friend comes and don't talk to him. He always does this. We don't have that excuse anymore. Hello. We cannot do that anymore. Why can't we do that anymore? It's because of neuroplasticity. And, you know, he can change. People can change. One of the reasons we are in the fix we are in in the world right now is because we are still operating on the idea no one can change. But the Buddha proved to us that we can change. So this is very exciting. And what we learned about right effort with your practice, with what you're doing, is if you keep doing it, you will slowly change. And that's the big difference in... Uh, the way this all works okay so that's it so i want to say thank you for going through this with me <laughs> and you can see that when you listen to all of this uh, you can hear how a lot of it's about the song huh and you might understand why the monk who taught me about it he said monks very rarely teach this and they don't teach it because I don't think they want to have their higher monk come to them. Why did you do that? People are coming and asking questions now, you see. They, they don't want to, they, you know. So that, that's why they're very hesitant to reveal these because a lot of stuff that was talked about is already going on and they don't want to rock the boat. In This is all traditions in all countries are under this, this type of pressure with these predictions. So you have to look at them for yourself. You have to decide, um, you know, you can see where it's happening and then you have to come back to the present time and you come to the present time and you keep practicing and you keep smiling and you say, whoa, I know these warnings are here. They're like framework, per, you know, perimeter warnings, be aware of where you go and you get involved. Ask questions. This is the biggest one. Keep asking questions. That's the one. He expected you to ask questions and every generation is expected to smoke out the sheds for yourselves. Smoking out the sheds is something they did when they harvested the crops about two weeks before they started storing it doesn't matter if it's tobacco leaves or it's food or anything. You go and take the shed that you're going to put the food in and you smoke it out traditionally and you sterilize it. Okay. Then you can. I have a question. Yeah. Yep. Okay. What's your question? Somehow I what? cannot hear. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I couldn't cannot hear, hear but I don't know. Do you have a question, Bharat? Cannot hear. Oh, I, Bharat, Bharat. Oh, setting. Uh, maybe you need to disconnect and connect. I don't know. Just give me a moment. Oh, now oh. it's coming. Here, we have it. We have it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, is there a sutta reference for these dreams which we can maybe refer to? That's my first oh question. My Let me see. Um, what you have to do now? Did you get? Did you get the document? If you get yeah, the document, yeah, I did. Go through it. Go through it and see if he, where he points to the um, the work he did. It gives you all his education. And probably, I'm thinking this monk that was responsible for the book, he did all of the research right. for a PhD or something like that. I think that's probably where it goes back to. I'm guessing, but I'm, I'm thinking that's probably where it. So it gives you the biographical work uh, for him. I'm looking to see if I can find it, but I can't really find it. But that's they're asterisk. Yeah, this was something that when we were, where I was when this happened was in Sri Lanka. This was a Mahatara monk who was, um, I was actually teaching him. I was at Siva in Palakali, the Sri Lankan International Buddhist Academy. It's a small university in Palakali. 
And I started teaching him and he got so interested in TWIM, he started in return giving me his speaking engagements. And then we had this one speaking engagement at Paramita Buddhist Center outside of Kandy. And the people had demanded that he teach this. And when a monk is asked to teach a subject, we're not allowed to say no. Hopefully the people have the sense to not ask for impossible things, but, you know, and so he had to find this and his teacher advised him and another Mahatera monk, uh, he was a Tara at that point, and these, his teachers, they recommended that we use this as a guideline when discussing this because this, this Thai monk had done such a tremendous work on putting this together the research and everything for it. You can find them, but I can't quote you where they come from. I can find out for you. I pro there you go, I'll promise you that. I do that, I'm pretty good at that. Can so I'll, I'll check with Bonte and I'll ask him exactly where they are in the text and I'll come back, okay? Second question, Mr. Kemal. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm probably asking you this like a personal question. Uh, I think as a culture, we are becoming more and more global. And I do get some notions that some of the things that we accept uh, as a cultural, culturally acceptable thing might be uh, quite immoral for say somebody who is uh, in the time of the Buddha or even uh, closer to uh, say 500 years ago or 600 years ago. So do you see any patterns uh, that... Do I see what? I, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, do, you, do I do you see, see any patterns? Do you see any patterns uh, where some behavior, maybe, you know, in lay people like us, you think is not acceptable? I went there, I've done that, been there, done that, seen that, okay. And coming into the Buddhist realm and leaving everything behind to another lifetime, coming in as a nun and watching the difference of when people are attempting to follow the five precepts, the way you have to, the way, the real way to answer this for you is to say, Bharath, test it, test it for yourself and see what happens, you know? But I don't want you to test it too far. Pay attention to the results, <laughs> you know? Or uh, testing it doesn't mean necessarily go out and do it, okay? Testing it can mean uh, look around you at the disastrous lives that people have had when they've gone out with their best friend's uh, mate or taken up with someone's wife or gotten into situations. Look at what happens when people marry who their parents absolutely don't want them to marry and they go against the grain and then they get married and have children and they can't get friend, they can't get the support of their parents that it's broken people, you know? See, I counsel a lot of people now and watching what happens with those people in their life situations when they're not keeping their precepts you see, what we realized in Dhammasukha, we realized that the modern day meditators have been allowed to think that precepts, five precepts are simply training precepts. And then you go to a retreat, you take your precepts, then you go home and you do whatever you want. In the West, this is very common. They I don't can't imagine that, Sister Kema. I, I really I can't imagine, imagine that. Imagine it. I know, but this is what goes on. Now, those people don't make progress in their practice. They don't find path. They think attainments are impossible and are willing to buy into any story that explains that that's something that may have happened back there, but they're not even willing to say it did happen back there with the time of the Buddha. But we found out something when we started looking more deeply who was making progress and who was not. And if you're keeping your precepts all the time in your life, you're protecting yourself from the hindrances coming and invading your life. 
You see, part of the problem was the adopt, adoption of teaching precepts to people when they're young and not telling them about hindrances being discussed until they start practicing at nine or 10 or 11 years old. But those precepts and hindrances should be taught together because the precepts are an umbrella to keep the hindrances from getting to you. You understand? Also, the precepts are guidelines. I don't think you should think about them as a lesson in morality. They are, but I want to show you something. You have a car. Do you have a car or a bike? We will soon purchase one, yeah. <laughs> okay, so when you purchase your car, your car operates on five fluids, okay? Five fluids. It has gas, it has oil. It has steering fluid, transmission fluid, and brake fluid. If you do not have these five things in your car, your car will not operate correctly and you will get stranded. That's the reality about your car. You have to, once you get it, you have to check the, check the levels all the time if you're driving in the city and find out how your car is operating on those fluids. Now, you're a human being. Let's say Bharath Ramesh model human being operates to peak performance mentally and physically with all aspects, food, eating, weight, sleep, exercise, everything working perfectly if you keep five things in order. And those five things are the five precepts. That is the mental state that the Buddha gave these precepts to the people for a perfect life that is not going to cause you stress and agony and angst and you know everything. If you keep the precepts, you'll have a good life. If you don't go in, you know, you can experiment. <laughs> but I never met anybody over 25 who had not experienced something that they did when something that happened when they were younger had come and kicked them from behind. And that was the karma coming back over something they had done or said with people when they were younger as a teenager growing up and paybacks really bad. So, so uh, yeah. I, I just want to uh, have a follow-up question on that. Has yeah. uh, technology and the use of all these devices, especially social media, right? I mean, it has complicated our lives to the point where uh, lying especially, right? It's, it has become more of a gray area than uh, and any other time in human history, I feel where I can write something and uh, yeah, I, it may or may not reflect my mood at the moment. But even when I uh, look at that, it's for a particular audience. So these kind of things, I don't know. I mean, it, it's just becoming more and more complicated, uh, keeping the precepts and while uh, using technology and so on. What do you feel about this? Worst case, um... Well, there are two worst cases I can tell you very quickly. One worst case was a guy who was um, in a relationship that was really suffering badly and he was addicted to pornography. And pornography operates about 70% of the income and in making money on the internet of anything else that's on the internet. All right, it's, it's in the 70s now, 70, 70 plus percent of what's on there for entertainment, right? And coming into TWIM and working with him and finding out it was actually going to change him. He realized if he devoted himself to it, he could change his personality and he could replace it. So how do you handle this? The Buddha was teaching you the way to change your mind and to change your mind. You have to look at you know, what is wholesome and what is whole, this is not a lesson in morality. I look at it as an operational lesson for humanity. And we have spoiled ourselves with the lessons of morality. Nobody wants to listen. But if I explain the car simile to a group of college kids, all of a sudden they understand. And I say, go ahead, sit down with your friends who have been stealing or lying or cheating or gossiping or slandering or cheating about their jobs and everything. See how they're living, see how they sleep. That's a big one. See how they have nervous leg syndrome and they can't sit still and they're bouncing their knees. See that? Because they broke the precepts. 
And even if they weren't using the precepts, people's legs are vibrating now like that. And that's always, you know, been a kind of condition, but it was because we're lying or hiding a secret or not honest. We don't fully understand, do we? We don't understand what human beings actually are yet, do we? That's an interesting thing in science, in psychology, in everything, in neurology. We don't understand who human beings are, our actual potential. They're coming now with some newest books that are coming out. Um, Bunty pointed out to me, there's a new book. Um, I don't know the name of it. He, um, there's a new writer, Huberman, I think is his name. H-U-B-E-R-M-A-N-N, I think. Huberman or Huberman. And that book is, I need to get it and read it as quickly as possible because that is what the Buddha is talking about. Okay, he's talking about the self and the illusion that there is a self and stuff and it makes us take everything personally and defend ourselves and I'm different and you're different and he's different, you see. Yeah, it's a big problem. The other one was a boy, a 14 year old boy. I went to uh, spend the night with a family. I was invited to come and spend the night with a family. She wanted to show me her Kuan Yin collection of Kuan Yin statues and her, her um, brother was addicted. Their parents had died and they were growing up with the grandparents whose lives were older and more settled and they were in their older years. And this boy shows up that they need to raise now and he's addicted to gaming. And now he won't go to school. He has to game hours on days because he's winning a tournament because he can't go to school anymore. He's, they, they can't make him study. They can't make him, leave. they won't discipline him at all. He's ready to go into a hospital facility. He's going to have to be put in a mental institution and sedated because he can't live life without gaming. He's totally addicted to it. It's worse than a drug. You have no idea. I was totally shocked any human being could get that addicted to a gaming system on the internet. Look at what that's done to us. Now, what these things are, are totally imbalanced activities. And the only way that you can, you know, for those who really want to understand Buddhism, part of it, I believe, is wanting to understand the potential of your mind. And to get to the purest, highest potential of your mind, if you want to decide to me, you say, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. If you're going to be lucky, if you're successful here in India, but if the way you'll be lucky and get the way you will succeed is by taking everything I'm teaching you and applying it to becoming an entrepreneur and you will succeed. You take Chanki Sutta and listen to the 12 steps and apply it to becoming an entrepreneur. I don't care if you're selling new shoe strings for shoes. I don't care, you will succeed. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is. Auntie Bunty, what is the name of that book? Uh, that, uh, that is not, uh, who was the author? Yeah. What was the book uh, you were saying? Huberman, Huberman, I got. Can you write I down that in chat? It wasn't you that sent it to me. I have to figure out who it is, but um, they sent it to me because it's what I'm teaching. <laughs> it was fascinating. The new theory on the development of the human mind. I thought you sent it to me. Um, you didn't, huh? Well, I'll have to flip through everything to find who it was. Maybe it's Ulysses. It's not Ulysses. Um, I don't know. Not who would it be? Uh, I, I want to say the name of the author is H U B E R M A N N, and it's a new new book, just probably available at Amazon now. And it's about neuroplasticity, but it's about it's about the realization that Buddha was teaching an accurate thing about Atta and Anatta. That's what it's about. So, uh, I think background was um psychology i think, I think it's about it's about like, neuroplasticity yeah. what it's about neuroplasticity but what's the name of it uh, 
Uh, anyway, I want to get my hands on yeah. it because I, I really want to read it. I don't know. Uh, it, it's not the one. Please share the name later. Yeah. I'll have to find it. For you. Is it Andrew yeah. Huberman? Uh huh? Is it Andrew Huberman from MIT? That's probably it. Okay, what did he just put a book out just now? A new book with a new theory. That that our self, the idea of the self, this is the, the key of it is the idea of the self is an illusion, yeah. which is totally supported by Buddhism. And he goes back and says that Buddha was correct. And he's now doing a theory that proves it. I don't know about that, but I actually listened to this guy. Uh he he's a professor there and when he actually deconstructed what he thinks the human mind is about he was basically saying something like the five aggregates and i was shocked to know that okay they, they, i mean they are now converging to the point where uh yeah they they don't want to assume a personality to start with science is coming his remarks in the in the thing about the book was science is catching up to the buddha and proving that his yes. teaching on Atta and Anatta were correct and that Atta is self-delusion. It's not real, that we, we aren't here. <laughs> we know enough about quantum physics to know that I'm sitting here. We know this tree isn't here because I have a green screen. <laughs> okay, but we know, I know that I feel the desk, but the reason I touch, I feel the desk is because I know it's a desk. Hey, it's, I, have I, a I have a question. I have a yeah. question. I have a question sure. regarding these five aggregates. Uh, uh, not five aggregates, the links of dependent origination. In this, sure. uh, for example, I was just uh, going through the Chachaka Sutta study, and when it says like I and form, uh, eye consciousness and eye contact. Eye contact in terms of scientific terms, can we say something like the contact of whatever we see, the input is touching to the mind. Can we, can we take it as contact as that one? All right, let's look at exactly what the Buddha says. First, there is the sense door. You're saying we'll use the eye. So we say first there is the eye and plus the form that it sees. What the eye sees, if I look at this, this bottle, this water bottle, the eye actually sees a yellow object, a yellow object, okay? Perception says it's a yellow drinking bottle. It's a name, it's in my encyclopedia up here. But look, the eye sees first form. And in order for the optical system to operate, you're correct, the mind has to come into it. And the part of the mind that's coming into it is called consciousness, consciousness is mind. Mind and consciousness are not separated, okay? So the, the mind application or, or where consciousness becomes active. Remember when you're looking at dependent origination, you're looking at uh, ignorance formations consciousness, that link consciousness back there is like a swimming pool inside of you full of consciousness. That is just gas and then it's gas in the car, but it doesn't become, it doesn't disappear and get used until you turn on the car and start the engine. You understand? Okay. So when, once I activate a sense door, the eye sees form plus eye consciousness, that is the mind part. If I was showing you on a whiteboard, that would be the mind part of this. So I form plus eye consciousness equal always equals contact okay just contact now Bhante names it when we when we do the chichaka sutta we do it for all different groups of people and when we do it we always name the contact name the feeling and name the craving all the way through but actually in the text in when you go back to the sutta it just says contact feeling craving okay we do that because some of the people in the audience, they don't even understand the five, the five sense doors are, and we're trying to teach them that the same time we're teaching them uh, the Chichaka Sutta. So to make sure you get the whole experience, when you listen to that, you close your eyes and walk through the whole experience. When you hear me read it or you hear Bhante read it, you listen to it 
and just sit there. It's one hour long. And you just be, you, when you're, you're not just listening to somebody reading something, you're going through the experience. My eye sees color and form plus eye consciousness. The three pieces make contact happen with contact as condition feeling arises with feeling as condition craving arises now i want to point out craving arises and the degree of it arising depends on the training that you've had for your mind the untrained mind it's really strong from that point the trained mind can be more cautious because you understand dependent origination you've been taught correctly the seven links that are the most important for you to observe in life are the pieces that make up events that you observe someone getting angry at you you getting frustrated you feeling sad you getting depressed all those things that come forth how do they operate the big one here in modern times is feeling is not emotion emotions have names anybody argues emotions are feelings stop it the first thing that happens on the equipment when we wire ourselves up is they have good enough equipment in the space program that they can tell when a brain is experiencing a pleasant, painful, or neutral feeling. So they proved the Buddha's point by that equipment. So contact happens, feeling arises, painful, pleasant, or neutral. With feeling as condition, uh, craving arises which is the eye now watch that's where everything changes we left the aggregates over here we said these are just the aggregates operating over here and we said the imperth there is an impersonal part of that 12 link chart and there is a personal part the red zone and the red zone is where the suffering operates and that's where you know craving is the i like it or i don't like it mine i like it i want it let's go get attached to it i don't like it i don't want it let's try to make it stop aversion right yeah that is how I, I have another question i this this yeah. clarified me i have another question let's go ahead go ahead today, today we read the 16 uh, 16 dream interpretations right and somewhere i read yeah prediction. Yes. Yeah. Somewhere I read that uh, Buddha says talking about future is not a good thing. Like, <laughs> like when, like when they were like. I'm okay. Once again, watch whenever you do that. We, that's a that's like teaching the Dhamma the wrong way. All right. Just to say that and nothing more is teaching the Dhamma the wrong way. Why? Because watch. Here you go. You live. You live. Come on, give it to me. All right, I want the chart. Give me the chart. Okay, you guys have to minimize for me for just a minute here. Uh, okay. Okay, now watch. Watch this. Say it again, what you're saying. Go ahead. He said yeah, that you're, mean, you're not um, supposed to so, talk uh, about the future. Yeah, so yeah. what? You remember so, this lesson? This is a basic lesson from the Bhattarikata Sutta. Here's the birth and here's the death. And where you are is you're moving in your little car, right? Remember the little car, right? There's the little car. And there's it's going this direction. Okay, so this is the life continuum line. This is your grounding lesson. This is the life continuum line. And here's the birth and back here is the past. And up here is the future. Is that correct, right? Yeah. Right? Okay. So where you exist, the only place that you are actually alive, this is fascinating to me, is when you're in the little car right here. And this is called the present. And we're not going to talk about moments, the present time. So whatever you're doing, that is where you are alive. Okay. Now, is it okay for you if you have a daughter? Is it okay for you to say that today, this morning, we're going to spend two hours, you and me, dear, and we're going to talk about your future. Let's talk about your future today, about you going to college, what your dreams and goals are, what you're good at, what you want to become when you grow up. Is it wrong for you to talk about the future that way? Of course not, because you're going to make this the topic for the car. You're gonna put it in the trunk 
and you're going to keep it and we're going to talk about it for two hours. When you finish talking about it, you're going to dump it out of the car and you're going to keep driving. <laughs> okay, that's the way you remember this. It's not wrong for you to be talking about the future, planning for the future, helping the climate change issue or helping the peace accords. It's not wrong for you to be planning for future generations. It wasn't wrong for the Buddha and it's not wrong for you. This is like one of the slippages I talked to you about where things slip out of alignment. And then somebody comes, if you're, a, they say, if you're a Buddhist, it's not okay to be rich. Is it okay for you to be rich? This is another famous one. Of course, it's okay for you to be an entrepreneur and get rich, even wealthy. The problem for you isn't getting rich and wealthy. The problem is what are you going to do when you have that money? How are you going to use it? Are you going to be thinking about it all the time like Scrooge and keeping it in a box and hiding in the attic in the room with the dark with one little candle, counting it every week? Or are you going to use your wealth sensibly and help people and yourself and your community and your world while you're here. You see, everybody's born and everybody dies. That's true. But the only important part here is what happens to you in between. What happens between from here to here? What are you gonna do with your life? That's what's important. You don't wanna get involved in the past because if you get involved in the past and you're thinking about it all the time. Now, once again, you can learn from the past. Don't forget the mistakes you made when you make a wrong turn, don't do it again, okay? But you don't dwell on them. The grandmother who, it's the grandmother who's sitting on the chair rocking and she's crying and you say, why is she crying? She's crying because she's, she's the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair of what happened to dad and me many years ago you understand that's where she's stuck so she's she is wasting away her energy for today sitting there crying she's not reliving those emotions because they're dead and gone that event is over and the future is the same way you don't know what it's going to be but you better make some plans and you better keep an eye out as you go along and today this time in the world you better wake up and start looking and make sure you have enough food stored up look at what happens with covid and the problems we're having just here and now with food and starting to show up okay okay and you make plans for when there's nothing wrong with getting a barrel and filling it up with enough food and storing enough water for two or three weeks of survival. If you honestly have indications that an EMP is coming in the next month or an asteroid is on the way and they really think it's going to hit. And if they finally, you knew that, you'd be kind of sorry if you didn't have anything stored up at all. But don't make your whole life storing up food for the future. You get it? Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's like saying, look, it's okay. It, just don't overdo it. But these, the two things you have to worry about back here in the past, it's I should have, I could have, I would have. That's the infection. Sitting there thinking in the present time, I should have, I could have, I would have. If only I did that. Oh, it's awful. You know, I shouldn't have done that. And you're not present with what you're doing. The other one that's bad is the future only when you start saying, oh my gosh, what if, what if, what if, what if this happens? And if all you can think of in your life is what if this happens, what if that happens and everything else, and you don't just make preparations, put them aside. Now go on with your life and stay in this present time. That's your strongest position for your mind. You understand the future, yeah. you understand the past, but you stay in the present time. You get it? Yeah, I get it. Yeah? Uh, okay. I have another question. Like, uh, like when in in suttas it says that Buddha have, for example, in MN seventy one in Bhagavata Sutta, it says Buddha have some 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 vidyas, some knowledges. Like he can see the his, he can see his past lives, manifold past lives, and. Mm -hmm. can, yeah. He can know how asavas can be stopped, such kind of things. But I never came across a, I don't know, is there any place Buddha said he can see what happens in future? 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, okay. You know, the pot, the story of the potter shed, remember the potter shed in 140? Yeah. 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 Remember, it, remember yeah, yeah. when they shared the potter shed? Why yeah. do you think the Buddha was there? Yeah. I know that I also why, got why? the same idea. I also got the same idea that Okay, that's why the Buddha was there. He looked every morning, the Buddha sat there, and what did he practice? He practiced a compassion for, he practiced compassion for all beings in the world for one or two hours in the morning. Then he decided where he was going to go. And the, in that case, is a perfect example. In the morning, one day, he saw this person and knew the potential for that human being was he would be able to become, uh, you know, an arahat or become, he knew he had the potential. Yeah. And so he went there in hopes of catching him because he also knew how he was going to die. The yeah. arahat know when they're going to die. Okay. They basically know exactly when they're going to die and um, can pinpoint it. And, but they don't get concerned about it because everybody has a beginning, a middle and an end. And you do the most you possibly can to get there. There's not an emotional bunch about this, you know, in it anymore. Can I say something like this? Like yeah, uh, yeah. Buddha knows this knowledge, but he, do, he officially doesn't share that. I know the future, something like that. Because in many the suttas, Buddha made, Buddha made some discussions with the monks. If you can, you know, do you know the story of um, Mogalana and, it, and the flagpole sort of thing, the big pole, and there was something on the top and yeah. somebody said, you know, um, whoever goes up there and gets it is really the smartest monk or something like that. So he, so, uh, you know, the Mogulana flies up, gets it and comes down and hands it to the teacher. He said, he said don't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> and why does he tell him not to do it again, okay? Well, then the Buddha talks about it after that incident happened. He starts to talk to them about why you shouldn't be doing that. And you shouldn't be doing it because you don't want people to come to you to be your students who are coming because you can levitate or you can fly or you can see into the future. The itties, they're called the itty, the development of the itties. You have the divine eye or the divine ear they they can develop and all the, i want to point out that all the arahats did not have all the itties oh. you know no they didn't get all the itties <laughs> it's funny you know they got some of them but they were not perfected all of them were not perfected by all of the arahats but they had the opportunity some of them had the there were some opportunity to develop this one or that one, or they use this one in this instance or that one, they got really good at one of them, but they didn't take all of them. Oh, well, Mogalana did because he was that, he was a sensitive and you have to be a sensitive to have the itty start developing. You can't be the intellectual. The intellectual is gonna go dig into the, keep studying and all that stuff you see and not, not even be able to sense that they can develop the itties, you see? But, as far as past lives are concerned, people can be taught to do past life work. You don't have to go to a hypnotist to do it. You can learn how to roll time backwards. But like people say, well, why don't you teach more students? I said, no, no, it's really hard. The person has to be here and you have to be around them all the time because you have to know that it's safe enough for them to do that kind of thing. They have to have enough equanimity that anything they see, they're not going to freak out. How am I going to do that with somebody online? <laughs> yeah. It's silliness. It's silliness. So you don't get involved with helping people to do that kind of work unless you're around them. If they have a bad phobia, like I did, I had a really bad phobia of heights all of a sudden at 51 yeah. years old. And Bhante taught me what to do. And I went through that and I realized it didn't have anything to do with this life. And then all of a sudden the phobia was gone. Now there are psychologists who are writing books about that. And they're saying it's a good idea, it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, maybe I have other questions. Uh, I don't want to waste others time. If you want to drop, you can drop. Sister Kema, are there any suttas officially Buddha given the training of Hindis? 
I haven't found them. Um, no, uh, I, but I'm not going to say there's not any. I have not found instructions. I have found the mention of them and gone to real old monks and talked to them about are they real and you know are they are they worth getting involved in and for it's it takes a lot of time to develop something to be really useful okay and so if it's not you know if you the problem is the personality that comes to you who wants to learn it is is a dangerous personality more times than it's a good one to work with that's the truth because they want to learn how to do these things so they can show off and get a thousand people to come around them. And that's all they're interested in. And they're interested in money at the gate in the end. You know, forget it. I don't want anything to do with it. You see? Uh, just okay, I have another question. Like, like uh, the cessation and Nibbana are different, right? It's, yes. That is cessation clear. and Nibbana are different. My question right? is, is the, going into experiencing cessation is that knowledge was available even before buddha was present like even be before buddha is there was knowledge of experiencing cessation but not experience well, what buddha. i personally know about this is something we should go and we should ask Bhante, but um ask Bhante that question but from my own training what i know about this is that there were things they were trying to do. They were trying to open the mind, but the, but the angle of everything was totally different than what the Buddha found really worked, okay? There's such a thing as blackouts, but blackouts are not stops. They are not the same thing, okay? Um, in blackouts, I, I, would, I would venture to say like this, and I'm not sure if it's accurate, and I'm just, I'm sort of proposing this, but, um, that possibly blackouts, our perception and feeling stop. The consciousness still remains, okay? And then you go on and you afterwards, it, after it's over, it comes back. It always comes back pretty quickly. And when it does come back, then um, there's no, uh, there's no uniform changes that have got, taken place in the body with the sense doors uh, being opened or the mind being opened. Uh, and those are mentioned in a lot of different traditions and a lot of different types of meditation, the blackout, okay? But what, what Gotama found, uh, what Buddha Gotama found was that um, you can get, the get to the point where the conditions become right to fall over the last, fall over into cessation. And the, but when it happens, it's a complete stop. So the difference with the stop is that for a brief time, a brief time, seconds, minutes, maybe, but the first time just it's a few seconds and feeling perception and consciousness shut down. This is my hunch about this, okay? The difference between the two, because I've been thinking like, what's the difference between these? The difference is that when you talk to the people who have had the blackouts, they don't give you any indication of anything like what the students are telling you if they have the stop happen. The stop is different. When the stop, after the stop occurs and the person goes in cessation and they notice the, the, the little tiny things that are happening as, it, as you turn back on, the whole system shuts down. And when the whole system shuts down, those little tiny, they're like raindrops or tiny so lights or little tiny somethings that go do 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 and they turn back on and then there's a like that at the top. That's nibbana. See, so if I draw it for you, what does it what is it really kind of look like on a on a drawing board? And the, the drawing board would be something like you're coming down. Um, oops, it's the wrong pen. That doesn't help. <laughs> okay, you're coming down like this. You're coming down like this through the different levels. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you're right here. And then you fall off. And when you fall off, you, you really fall off like that. And it's like a stop. Okay. And then this is the cessation. And then you turn back on and but you turn back on it goes one do 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 four five six seven eight, 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 eight. and then it goes 
like it, everything opens up. And when you come all out of this, you, when you, when you come out of that opening physically, mentally through your sense door systems, everything is like accentuated immensely, immensely. It's incredible what happens. And there's a shot of energy that goes through the body. That's different. It's like a life source energy. I don't know how to explain, but in chakras, there are all different kinds of energies that operate in the body. This is not a sexual energy. This is not um, a heart, just heart energy. This is different. It's a kind of surge of energy. People do different things with this. Some people just say, whoa, that was incredible. And they walk around looking at things, listening to things. You know, if they taste something or smell something, it's amazing the difference of the level of the sense receptors. Okay, it's everything has changed. But the other thing that has happened is there's the surge of energy overall that what are you going to do with it? And the teacher will say, good, take a walk and go back and continue sitting. You watch what they do. They'll go and relish in it and want to hold on to it and not come back and continue sitting, or they'll come back and they'll continue sitting. If they just accept it and observe it and come back and keep sitting, then they might go from this being a sakitagami to a, so I mean, a, a sotapanna to a sotapanna and fruition. They might have it happen again. Okay. So how many times can, the question is, it's like a game. Uh, okay, the question I, uh, we had when we were playing with this at the center one time was, it's a game, okay? Here's the, here's the top game question. It's like uh, trivia, okay? How many times does an arahat and fruition experience Nibbana? That's the question. Uh, how many times, Arahan? Creation How many times does the, per the person has achieved arahant and fruition? The top one, the, the super the mundane last one experience that seals that seals the arahant position, the arahant solid. It, when that happens, how many times did the student experience nibbana? The stop, the drop down, the stop, the turning back on. The bang opening. Actually, like how many per, times per, had per, had he gone through that? Yeah, for sota panna, it is not required for one to become one to experience. You don't have panna. you don't have to, but it is possible that if you're if it's you're training, seven. if you're training the way we're training, most people are going to go to go to the what we think is sota panna level through the training so they do experience it but some people we have had a few that have experienced the sota panna happening by listening to the suttas being read that we've we've seen that happen but most of the time the people are on path and they it's the path is going to fully operate so sota panna sota panna fruition sakadagami sakadagami fruition anagami anagami fruition arahat arahat and fruition that's eight times and this one at the end is the super mundane oh, grand opening final finale sealed tight that is an arahat with fruition you understand do you understand the attainment and the fruition is yeah. not happen. Okay, there's too much evidence in the text when it says how many how many uh, when the when it says there are eight kinds of individuals in the Buddhist camp, or it says there are four pairs of people in the Buddhist camp. What does it mean? Four pairs is eight. Yeah. Or there are eight kinds of people. It's yeah. talking about the people who are working on becoming Sotapanna, Sotapanna and Fruition group, and the people who are trying to get to be Sakadagami, and then the group going for Sakadami. And so that tells you right there that anybody who says that you get an attainment and right like that, the fruition is there, it's not true. That tells you that. Some it people, does not happen, people, absolutely does not happen in one seventeenth of a jawana moment. That's the expression that the commentary said, if you experience one of the attainments, okay, 
that when you experience the fruition, it happens one seventeenth of a jawana moment after you get to be sotapanna, you've got the fruition. Not true. And I can prove it to you by showing you the suttas that are talking about eight kinds of individuals and four pairs, because there wouldn't be eight kinds of individuals, would there? Or or a or four pairs. Some, some people say that uh, like if somebody is sotapanna or somebody is sattagami, not fruition, they will attain fruition when they die. I heard this. Is it true? This this is possible that um, you know we don't know what happens after somebody, but on, as they're going through, they can they can in the last moments before they die go into another level and attain. Sure, why not? Means, uh, I, okay, but uh, there is no sutta evidence for this, right? Sure, there is. Um, yeah, let's see. Wait a minute. Um, okay, well, go back to the potter shed and look at the end of the sutta. Go back to the potter shed and at the end, watch what, what did he tell the monks in the case of the potter shed. It's 140, right? Is that right? Yeah, oh. yeah, I also have that. What what one is the potter shed? Oh, here, here we go, potter shed. At the end of the sutta, what did he tell the other monks is the question. After he teaches them and everything, what did he say? A number of bhikkhus went to the blessed one and paying homage to him, they sat down on one side, told venerable the clansman Pukasati, who was brief instruction with the blessed one has died. And then it says, Bhikkhu's the clanman, uh, it says, what, they ask him, what is his destination? What is his future course? And the Bhikkhu's, the clansman Pukasati was wise. He practiced in accordance with the Dhamma. He didn't give me any trouble about the interpretation of the Dhamma with the destruction of the five lower fetters. The clansman Pukasati reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes with the attain and will attain on fi final Nibbana there in, in the pure abodes, okay, without ever returning to this world. That's telling you that when the Buddha was teaching him, he became Anagami. So while the Buddha was teaching him, he was flipping through the, the attainments to the level of Anagami, okay, with fruition. It would have been Anagami with fruition because He's saying when he gets to the pure abodes, he will attain the final nibbana there. So that would be the uh, arahat and so, arahat yeah. fruition. See? Okay. I mean, you know, every time I hear this one, I'm always crying at the end of the sutta because the cow killed him. Yeah. <laughs> I can't handle it. I mean, I just, I just can't handle the fact that Pukasati and the Buddha get together and he teaches them everything he needs to know and then he goes out to get his robe and his bowl to be ordained and on the way back a stray cow killed him and i'm thinking oh man that's because he was mean to cows in another lifetime he was mean to cows and this this came back that came back on him at that moment but he still made an attainment poor pukasati <laughs> <laughs> If there are time, I, I might ask a lot of questions, but we can continue. Well, that's good. I have to remember to tell you to come when I have a big question time. You're very good to ask yeah. questions. So now, actually, in, you have any there are, if there are many people, uh, uh -huh. I might not have enough time to ask. That's why I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I never run out of questions because on this last tour that we went on, there were eight retreats and right here in this cabinet above me, there's 190 questions. 190 questions. So anytime there's not a question, I can always take some of those and put them on the desk and answer those questions. Yeah. Sister Kema, I feel like my hindrance in my practice is my curiosity, I feel. Because I whatever have whatever uh, arises, my mind go, going into that and uh, basically it's not uh, letting it be you're there. Suffering. Anyway. You're suffering from first of all, you're suffering from disobeying all the rules that the Buddha told you about the hindrances. 
So if you, you're not, you know, I only see you guys, I only see you on, on Sundays, but if we were to just do a course on just the hindrances and nothing else, okay, there's nine or 11 suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya that give express instructions what to do when a hindrance arises and another section in the Samyutta Nikaya. But the one that is absolutely the clearest one you're ever going to hear is in number 22, the Aligadupama Sutta, and it's in section, I love this, it's like Mr. a military. Tema, can we do this on a weekly basis then? Military. Yeah. Just on the hindrances. Yeah, hindrance is very good topic. Well, the, when I teach him to the other group, I mean, there's more time and we actually do the whole sutta so you can hear what he's instruction. But if I, um, you know, tell you, the secret of the 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 warnings he's he was not vague about this he was very strong on in giving instructions to the monks and the lay people about the suttas so when somebody comes to me and says like what you said you're just ignoring the law the law is to abandon this uh the two laws about the hindrance one is a a hindrance has absolutely nothing in in it to give you that's going to take you to nibbana so leaving your object of meditation and moving over to it, you're going to an empty hole. And B, the, the, the main prime directive is to abandon the hindrance. Stop feeding the hindrance, you see? And the one you, you touched on the very important part, the curiosity, the, the component of curiosity. You know, you have the seven... The whole point of this whole thing, the hindrances, in the beginning is it's disturbing me. How do I make it stop? You leave it alone. And why would I tell you that? And have you expect to believe me? Because of Anicca. Now, Anicca is one word, okay? It means whatever arises always passes away. Everything is always changing. So if you don't, if somebody tells you you need to sit for one hour, and you're, you're sitting for one hour, but you come to a report and you say to me, but I can only stay with my spiritual friend or sending to the directions, whatever you're doing. I can only do that for maybe two, three minutes. I'm there. Well, like, why? You sat for a whole hour. That's great. But that, how many times did you leave if you did that? And once you, once you went over there, uh, one time I made the mistake of asking a woman, if you spend two minutes on it before something comes up, how long, what do you do then? Oh, I go over there and I need to know what it is and why it came up. <laughs> <laughs> well, then my next question was, well, then how long, let's take this 60 minutes. How long did you stay there? I don't know, maybe three minutes, five minutes. I don't know. I was, where did it come from? It's like, you know, it's like an old friend from high school knocking on the door and it shows up and he's, oh, you're Fred. Well, where have you been? What have you been doing for the last 10 years? How come you, you know, what's your profession? Where do you live? And you're asked, what are you doing? You, when you're, if you're really wanting to open the mind, the path to open the mind is to take the object, stay with the object of meditation and don't go away from it. Keep doing what we're telling you to do. Only the instructions here, look, in 72, you write this down. Don't let this stuff go by. You take 72 section 18, you know, here's the guy who wants to tell the Buddha he wants to talk to him about all the things that he does when he practices all these other traditions, all these other ways of practicing. And what's the Buddha end up telling Vacha? He says, look, it's enough to cause you bewilderment, Vacha, enough to cause you confusion. This Dhamma is profound. It's hard to see and hard to understand. It's peaceful and sublime, but it's unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle, and to be experienced by the wise, the people who can see the dependent origination. It is hard for you to understand it, listen clearly, if you hold another view, accept another teaching, approve another teaching, pursue a different training, or follow a different teacher, he couldn't be more clear. If you're going to work with me as a teacher, do what I'm telling you to do. Don't tell me it doesn't work. And you come to your, your interview and you say, well, when it came up, I was only two minutes on the object of meditation. And then I just went over there when that came up. 
just to see who it was. Do you want tea? Would you like cookies? Do you want me to come sit down and talk to you for a while? Or can I go back and meditate? You know what? You get your picture in your mind, you know? What's the person doing? So that's what the Buddhist position on this was. Don't mix it up with anything else. If you want to get to the end result, I'm telling you that you can reach. That's what he's doing here when he's talking to him. And he was very clear. Don't, you can't, you can't, um, if you hold another view about how to do things, accept another teaching you've been doing a long time, approve of another teaching, pursue a different training while you're learning from what I'm telling you and follow a different teacher. You're trying to do both. Well, the guy who was trying to do both spent seven years before he came, became a, a soda con at our place. And finally, he realized he wasn't going to be getting anywhere if he didn't stop mixing it with another teacher and another practice. And finally, he actually went through and he, be, he began to understand that the thing is that by not using the texts for so long, they don't have all these little angles I'm talking about because I kind of live inside the book. <laughs> I kind of live inside the book. <laughs> Flip it, yeah. I wake up in the middle of the night and get an answer and I sit in the morning and I get an answer and somebody calls and I get the answer and I try to find it from the book. So this is one of the big deals. Very specifically, he told you, didn't he? Okay, so if you hold another view, if you accept another teaching, if you approve another teaching, if you're pursuing a different training or if you're following another teacher, you're not gonna get the same results that we're talking about. That's that, why, that's why the that's why the greener the person who comes with nothing, never sat in meditation. Can you teach me? Boom, they follow my instructions. They don't argue with anything. Boom, 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 bang. I get nibbana. That's why. That's that person. Okay, the but other I, I one. Follow, let's I do follow. The other one is number twenty-two, <laughs> in section six. Okay. Number 22 in section six, and that's on six, 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 six is section six is on two page 225. Okay, uh, okay, this he says to this, this monk is arguing with the Buddha, he's saying that if something comes up, it's okay for me to move over there. <laughs> this is this is probably uh, the the book that the, the woman read before that I'm telling you about. She probably read that one. And then he, the Buddhist position is misguided student. He says, just in general, <laughs> to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions, how they get our obstructions, how they are able to obstruct you if you engage in them? So what does that tell you? If I engage in that thing that rose up, that obstacle, it will become an obstruction. So how does that work? Okay, then I take you into Samyutta Nikaya, and when I show you that, it explains to you in a discussion in the Samyutta Nikaya on page 1597, there is a discussion that is about uh, a discussion about the hindrances in relationship to the arising or the non-arising of the enlightenment factors, okay? It's about the hindrances. So the, it's, the title is the nourishment or the de and the denourishment. How, how do they get nourished, the hindrances? And how do they get denourished? But the discussion is about the nourishment and the denourishment of a hindrance in direct relationship to the arising or the non-arising of the enlightenment factors. Now, to get to cessation, all seven enlightenment factors have to be perfectly balanced, perfectly balanced, all seven of them, just like that. And what, not like this, but just like that, and once they're like this in the computer game, then you go to the next level. Boom! <laughs> you go to the next level. It's like those computer games you play. See? 
but you can't get them in line if you are fooling around with any hindrance that comes in. This is another interesting thing. In some traditions, they'll say that when you're in these levels of examination and observation, you can't possibly have any hindrances ever come up. That's, they're talking about um, concentration meditation and one point of concentration. Yeah, Sister Kim, you are saying that uh, you need to follow only one teacher. I, I recently started listening to Bhante Punnaji's videos. Bhante Punnaji's explanation. It's going to get you confused about, I'll tell you where you're going to get confused. You're going to get confused about your aggregates. Then you're going to get confused about dependent origination. Because he, in the end, when he was, you know, I was there the year that he died. And I talked to him several times before he passed away. And I, you know, I, he wanted, he was, he was presenting a terminology based on what he decided was the way to explain it, but it's contrary to Bhikkhu Bodhi's translations and anyone else's. And if you get involved with that terminology and you're not sticking with the terminology we're giving you, he's going to start telling you that um, he's going to eliminate vinyana, which is consciousness, and he's going to put more importance on perception, which is sanya, than he needs to. And then he's going to explain, he's going to get very, he's going to, it, it mucks, it kind of mucked up my head. And I asked him, why are you doing this? Why are you making the experience of the sense doors, like the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, so complicated? It doesn't have to be complicated. You can live with what the Buddha decided was the simplest way to explain it to you. Look, but, as, uh, a, I as a monk, that. I'm going to point one thing out. As a monk, Dr. Poonerji, he was our friend. You know, I knew him. He was like my, my grandfather, spiritual grandfather type thing. When I, the first year I was working with Bhante, he was at Washington Buddhist VR. I knew him, you know. And he was only teaching what he's teaching this way for let's see, you would say 20 years, maybe uh, 10, 15 years, and he keeps developing it. And he keeps trying to stay in touch with the neuro neurological development, uh, neuroscience, but, but he, he got too entwined in being a doctor and, and talking to another doctor about how you see. That's a good example, what his lecture about seeing. He had to tell you the anatomical basis of the optical system in the human body and take you to a high level third year or fourth year medical student's version of how the eyes see. You don't need that to get to Nibbana. You do not need to get things conglomerated like this in your mind. You need to set what is the simplest foundation information you need in your mind like that they're not going to go like this to you they're just going to be there and support you to do your practice and we spent years boiling it down and when i heard that he was going to change the terminology of vinyana consciousness and perception i said to him you know i who am i and yeah. i'm nobody i'm nobody but he's known me for since i've started and i said if you do this you're going to have to go back into this book and rewrite everything this book says about the five aggregates and the six sense doors and you're attacking abhidhamma as well you're trying to change the abhidhamma structure i don't approve of that that much because it's overthinking but you're going to be trying to attack that and I said, look at yourself. You're you're 88 years old. Do you want to try to do that now? Do you have time to rewrite the text and present your own version of a translation? And he said, well, no. But it's fun because they liked it. And there's when you sit in the room with 40 or 60 people listening to him, he was doing very well at the end with what he was teaching persistently. And now he has a bunch of people carrying that whole thing through that are, are protecting his teachings and spreading it. That's what people do. And so awesome. they, yeah. Actually for me, like I am Indian background. So his translation of Pali words are, means based on my Pali understanding and my based on my Pali is nearly to Hindi. 
and his explanation of pali terminology was kind of more accurate i felt that's why i was that's attracted okay to and and i agree with you in a lot of things he said about pali definitely true yes. you know yes. definitely the thing about um abanti punaji was this is interesting banti punaji is responsible for banti rimula ramsey how does that fit your head because it was punaji banti punaji who taught uh, who examined how banti was teaching and told him about this book and said this has been printed in 1995 take this and move away from completely away from the the uh commentary and take this book and try to see what i'm talking about go to this book only and so banti took the book and went into thailand and then he went in the cave and he spent so many months it was almost 3 months before he came back over to malaysia and when he was there he went through this he told me how he did it daily he went through it and took the ones the the suttas it's about 76 of the 152 suttas that are talking about something valuable for your practice the rest of them are teaching you more about they're not we didn't include them in the, in the index that we built we didn't include the other ones because they were stories you know that help you